Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study. Our scripture tonight will come from Philippians, the third chapter, verses 13 and 14. Philippians, the uh, third chapter, verses 13 and 14. And it says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the Lord Sattler from the Holy Trinity Church sent me a devotional this morning that says, I've heard it said that the reason the rear view mirror is small is because where you've been is not as important as where you are going. As we journey through life, situations and circumstances from the past can cloud or threaten our forward movement. But Paul encourages us to press on, keeping our eyes toward the prize. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. I feel like going on. I feel like going on. The trials come on every hand. I feel. in Jesus' name we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity just to bless your name and thank you for just being good and being God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us today. Bless our lives. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you. And bless us, Father, that we will be about your business. Bless us in Bible study tonight. Bless us, Father God, that your word will be real to us that we will make a difference in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. I feel, feel like, like going on. Yeah, you gotta feel like it. You gotta feel like it.
Thank God for another privilege to be at Bible study. Amen. Thank God for all of you who are gathered here tonight. What chapter are we in and sharing the gospel tonight? Chapter 3, right? Chapter 3. We're in chapter 3. We're looking again. We're looking again at personalized. Personalized, right? Personalized. So there are how many P's to effective evangelism? There are five P's to effective evangelism, and they are? My God. My God. Prepare. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Personalize, picturize. Jesus, Jesus. Okay, let's try this again. Everybody, there are how many P's to effective evangelism? Five. Five P's. Everybody agree that there are five. Five P's to effective evangelism. And they are in unison all together, all at one time. They are? Prepare. Okay, let's try it again. They are prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. All right, there are five P's to effective evangelism. We've gone through one and two, and tonight we look to finish chapter three, which is the third one, which is personalize. Okay? Personalize. Hope I got everybody's attention. Everybody's attention, right? Everybody's attention. So we discovered in the past lessons that the, the most important P is the first one, and that is prepare. prepare, right? And the reason why prepare is more important than all the rest of them is because you must be prepared in order to win souls. We are soul winners. We are those who will prepare the atmosphere for the coming of the doctor. Who's the doctor? His name is Jesus. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus is the one who saves. Amen? No one saves but Jesus. In one of my sessions, I was teaching this lesson many years ago, and I said, if you've been saved by any other means, any other person other than Jesus Christ, you are not saved. What do you think about that statement? Yes or no? That's true. Yes. Yes. So, the lady says to me, well, what about all these other means? I wanted to say you've been watching too much Oprah, but I didn't. Oprah has, has stood up and said that there may be several ways, and she's even had guests to give those ways by which men, women, boys, and girls can be saved. I contend, and my conviction is, that no one comes to God except through Jesus Christ. So we must be prepared to share. We must be prepared to win souls. We must do several things in order to be prepared. We must know the word. First of all, we must be born again. We must be born again. Then we must know the word. Then we must pray over the word. Then we must pray the word. We must meditate on the word. We must study the word. We must involve the word in our personal lives. In order to be prepared, you must study the Word of God. That's why we're doing Bible listening. That's why we're doing Bible reading, because we need to know the Word of God. Amen? A weak Christian is a Christian who does not know God. And we can't know God unless we know His Word. That's why the psalmist says, God showed Himself, His ways to the Moses, and his mighty acts to the children of Israel. Especially if you're going to lead or you're going to teach, you must know God's ways. You must study God's ways. And there is nothing new under the sun. The devil tried the same old tricks, but God is still God. And he is still the almighty God. So we must always focus on the fact that we need to know the word of God. And we must be prepared to share. We must spend what percentage in preparation and what percentage in actually sharing the gospel? This is a good test night. Uh, uh, what do you call it? A pop quiz night. What percentage was we, was we, must we share and then what percentage must we spend time in preparation? Who's talking? 
9010. 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. What does that mean? We spend 90% in preparation. We spend 10% in actually sharing the word of God. Why is that so so much of a difference? Why? Or do you feel like that's right? Okay, so you need to be prepared. There are some guys in the Bible. They confronted the demons. They're going to call them out. So they can you turn the organ off for me, please? So we must spend 90% of our time in preparation. 10% of our time in actually sharing because we must be prepared. Amen? We must be prepared. If you're not prepared, remember the guys in the Bible? They approached the demons, they approached the devil, and when they approached the demons and the devil, the devil spoke to them. Paul we know. Jesus we know. Who are you? And then they put the WWE on them. Are you with me? So the bottom line is we need to be prepared. Right before we go to any foreign country, they'd spend six months preparing you to go. Six months to spend four days to a week in a place. And in that six month period, they talk about demonic possession and demonic attachment. They talk about demonic spirits. And they teach you how to approach, how not to approach, and they teach you what they expect. And out of all their teaching, the bottom line is you stand on the word of God, you stand in the name of Jesus, and the devil has to flee. And of course, those, those that were demonic possessed, they actually came to us. But we call on the name of Jesus. I mean, these people are really demonic plagued. They are really demonic possessed. And they really come after you. America got it so sweetly. America has it so well made. Because we, we see stuff every now and then. These people live in it every day. So you must be prepared. Then pinpoint. You want to make sure that you keep your eyes on Jesus. So as we trans, transfer from one chapter to the other and trans. Uh, move from one trans one chapter to the other. We understand that Jesus is the main attention and the main attraction. Jesus is the captain of the ship. It's not about us. So when we get to personalize where we are tonight, chapter three, people have a tendency to make it about them. It's about me. It's it's about what I can do. It's about the power I have. The Bible teaches that we must show patience. We're just a nurse that prepares the atmosphere for the incoming of the doctor. We're just a nurse. We will never be the doctor. We're just the nurse. The nurse is important, but the nurse has to be prepared. So we must prepare the patient, prepare the atmosphere for the incoming of the doctor. Every patient has a heart condition. Every unsaved person has a heart condition. Uh, Brother Whitlock, can you get 2 Chronicles 16 and 9? Um, Sister Davis, can you get Acts 1 and 8? Brother Miles, can you get Matthew 28, 19 through 20? We must be prepared. We must make sure that we are focusing on Jesus and him alone. And then the third thing, as we will see in personal lives, we have to get on their level. Why not say we got to get on their level? Will people hear you better when you're ahead of them, above them, or would they hear you better when you're on their level? On their level. On their level, right? So I, I gave the demonstration last week that every child that comes to shake my hand or hug me, I get down on my knees if need to be to be on their level. It's less intimidating. Second, Second Chronicles 16 and 9. Acts 1 and 8, Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20. Brother Whitlock. 
Second Chronicles 16 and 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this ye have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Amen. So we're more concerned with the first part because the first part gives us promise. But the fact of the matter is, there's a second part. And it gives us curses. Second Chronicles 16 and 9 says, The eyes of the Most High God, the God of hosts, the God of war, is looking to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for somebody he can make himself or show himself mighty through. Where well, men can see that he's mighty. Remember, it gives God the glory, not us. So he says, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself mighty to those who our hearts are turned toward him. The fact is, we got to make sure that our hearts are turned toward God. Make sure our hearts are pure. Make sure we're focused on godliness. Make sure we're focused on the things of God. Who has Acts 1 and 8? Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus says, and you shall receive power, dynamite, dudamas is the word power. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has made himself present. After you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to have power. This Deuteronomy's power in Acts 1 and 8 is explosive power, dynamite power. The example that I give a lot of time is the police officer. He or she has a gun. He or she has a taser. He or she has a blackjack and a bunch of other stuff. That is explosive power. That is deadly power. But when you look at Acts 1 and 7, the word power is there, and that is exclusive power. That is the authority. The authority is the fact that he or she has a uniform on. That person has a badge. That person ride around in a marked or unmarked car that's paid for by the city or the state or the federal government. That's the authority. When they show up, they say, I got authority to come and talk to you. The problem is sometimes we disrespect that authority and things go bad from that point on. We find out we really can't win. So this authority that they've been given according to Romans 13 and Hebrews 13, this authority has been given to them by God. Yes, many of them abuse it, but the uniform, the badge, the ID says, and the name tag says, I have authority. That's the type of power he talks about. Sister Whitlock, can you give Romans 5 and 8? Sister Irving, can you get Matthew 5 and 16? Who has, who has Matthew 28, 28, 19, and 20? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, <coughs> even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Sister Jones, can you get Galatians 6 and 9? So when we look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus again said, go. Jesus is saying, make sure you make disciples. Jesus is saying, make disciples that those disciples will become as I have taught you to be. I always say that um, when a disciple matures, he will be better than his master, better than his teacher. When a disciple matures, he or she will be better than his teacher. Better. Not as good as, but better. 
So those who train us, we have godliness involved in us, and then we bring that godliness to the table. And when we bring that godliness to the table, then we take what the teacher teaches us, and we become better than the teacher. Yes? Maybe? Depends on how we apply ourselves, right? Amen. Patience. 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 Patience is waiting. Slowing down. Being patient. As a soul winner, we must remember how patient God was with us. The soul winner must remember how patient God was with him or her. And we must show that same patience toward others. We must show that same patience toward others. We must be patient. The problem is, many times... What we do is we get saved and we act like nobody's saved but us. Give me an example of somebody acting like no one's saved but them. Somebody give me an example. I'm acting like nobody's saved but me. I mean, I'm just, I'm saved, I'm saved to my bones. Anybody? Y'all never seen anybody like that? They act like no one's saved but me. The only person going to heaven but me. So God created heaven just for me. Does that even sound right? <laughs> well, what was God doing before you were even born? Before you even thought about? So we know that's, that's crazy, right? But that's the attitude. Anybody else? Have you ever seen or have you ever been like that? When you get saved, you're so excited about the Lord that, ooh, ain't nobody saved but me. I was uh, I know someone that feel that uh, because of their church a uh, different denomination than ours that uh, he and I had a conversation he said well you're not going to heaven uh, because only my church is the only church Okay. Mm -hmm. I said well you keep believing that so there are people who believe that their church as in their denomination and there are people that actually believe their church as in their location that they're the only people going to heaven does that even sound no. right does that even sound like how god would talk because we are prepared as soul winners and we know as soul winners that it's not the church that put us in heaven it's jesus that gets us there and it's not that we accept the church it's the fact that we accept the, the one who died for the church. It's Jesus. A lot of denominations have come to the conclusion that you're not going to heaven because of this or because of that. There are denominations who, who put you in hell because you got instruments in the church. But they always send their children to music classes. So I asked one day, well, why are you sending your daughters to music classes and you don't believe that music ought to be played in the church? Well, the answer was, well, they can play musical instruments somewhere else. So my answer was, yeah, in the club. Because if we don't provide a place for them in church, they will play in the club. If we don't provide opportunities for children especially African-American children and Hispanic children and Asian children, if we don't provide a place for them to stand, express themselves, and learn how to speak and learn how to carry themselves at home and at church, guess what? The world will provide something, especially in this TikTok age, especially in, in this social media thing that we got going. Everybody can be an instant star right after a million shows. And these million shows can take place within one hour. One million people, one person hit like, next person hit like, one person hit share. And when you share one time, it could be a million people within 30 minutes to an hour. And now you're famous. After it took Aretha Franklin years. <laughs> but you can be famous in a moment. 
quickly. So we have to perform platforms and put together platforms that, where children can express themselves. So we have to be patient. Romans 5 and 8, who's with me? Romans 5 and 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God was patient with us. We were doing our thing. And in the meantime, Christ died for us. Somebody said, well, when Christ died, I wasn't even here. But you know, God speaks eternally, even before eternity gets here. God knows the mind of God was already in, in gear. The mind of God was eternally before us. God was in eternity past. He's in eternity present. He is going to be in eternity future. Matter of fact, God is in eternity future even right now while we're in the present. Because it's God. So while we were yet in our sins, while we were yet doing our thing, Christ died for us. So when a person dies, it's not just another dope dealer or prostitute dead. It's somebody that God really cares about. God loves. And we have to be patient with people because God was patient with us. You may not have been a drug dealer. You may not have been in the, in the homosexual lesbian activity. You may not have, have been a thief. But God was patient with you, regardless of what you had done, because Romans 3 and 23 says we all have sinned. We all have fallen short. So we got to be patient with other people. Amen? Who has Galatians 6 and 9? And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. We got to keep doing good. Got to just... Just practice doing good. The old preacher preached a sermon called Be a, a Do-Gooder. Be a Do-Gooder. Find yourself doing good. Be a good doer. Be a Do-Gooder. Whatever you do, don't get weary in it. Be long-suffering. The soul winner must remember how long God dealt with him and tolerated his sinfulness. God tolerated our sinfulness. God put up with us. And we can't put up with anybody. Because we say we're going to heaven anyhow. We're on our way now. We're on our way to heaven. But God tolerated us. God tolerated our sinfulness. Do not be weary in doing good. God has done good for us. He's done the ultimate good. Don't get weary. Keep doing good. Remember, when they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're re rejecting God. Amen? Who has uh, Matthew 5 and 16? Whatever you do, let your light shine. What is that talking about, sister Irvin? Let your light shine. What, that's, that's church talk. What, is it, what are they talking about? Simply being a light for other people and live so they can see the things, the good things that you do. So you got to live a life where other people can see the good things you do. Are you doing things and other see, people see you doing good? Are there some things in your life that other people can see that draws them to Christ? It goes right along with doing good, setting forth a good light. Be a light. Matthew goes on to say, you don't take a light and set it under the bushel. You don't hide it under a bushel, but you sit it on a candlestick, on a hill where everybody can see it. I think it was Charles Barker who said, I am not an example or a role model for anybody. In the moment he said that, I said, you sure not. Okay, so a role model is somebody that you can get a role from. <laughs> a role model is somebody that you can see, you can touch, you can help, you can put you can put your hands on them every now and then. A role model is somebody that's setting forth a good example. So the moment he said he's not, he's right, he's not. What are the most famous what children think of role models? What are some of the most famous? You don't have to call a name, but just their careers. 
their grandmother, dancers, sports figures. Sports figures. And you know what? What did you say? Rappers. And check this out. The greatest one, maybe that was named tonight, the greatest one is the grandmother, but they are the least looked upon. The greatest, the greatest role model are those people who are living right and doing right before you, growing you up to make sure that you're going to do right. They're the greatest role model, but children choose something else. Who would you choose? Who's your role model? Who has been your role model for life? It's those people that suffered for you. Those people who went out of their way for you. Those people who are committed to you regardless of how bad you get. They still love you. I watch old women, old men that can barely make it on walkers and canes go down to the prison and put their mouths up to this nasty plexiglass where everybody else, or this, this screen where everybody else has put their mouths up to. Or they pick up this phone and use this phone that everybody else has used. And they suffer because their baby is down there. They don't care whether he was right or wrong, he's my baby. The joker can be an eight-time loser. What's an eight-time loser, brother, with love? Eight-time loser. Sister Whitlock, what's an eight-time loser? <laughs> he messed up eight times. He messed up and got caught eight times. He's an eight-time loser when he got caught eight times. Now, he messed up some other times. But parents and cousins and uncles and neighbors, they don't care. I got to go take care of this girl, take care of this boy. So put your your light on a candlestick. Put your light on a hill. Put your light on a light stand, stand so somebody else can see it. You don't hide it. Don't let it get blown out. Don't let depression sit in where people see you going the wrong way and acting the wrong way. So, Brown, can you get John 3.16 for it? 16 and 17. John 3.16 and 17. So, glorify the name of Jesus before men that they will come to believe and trust in God. Glorify the name of Jesus so they will come to believe and trust in God. You want to be one who draw, draws me into Christ. You want to draw me into Christ. You want people to, to follow Christ because of something you've said or something you've done. So they can come to believe and trust in God. Love, the soul winner, must remember. I said a soul winner must remember. The soul winner must have a clear memory. The soul winner must remember God's love loves us rather unconditionally. God's love for us is unconditional. God loves us unconditionally. What does that mean? Sister what does unconditionally mean? God loves us unconditionally. What does that mean? There's no conditions. Say again. There's no conditions. There are no conditions. So people always ask, once you're saved, if you murder somebody, are you still saved? Brother Miles, what you tell him? If you're saved and you murder somebody, are you still saved? If you were saved before, you're saved after. <laughs> Question is if, right? Now, there's only one person who knows if a person is saved. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Regardless of who he is, regardless of what he's done, only one person knows who's saved. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He alone knows who is saved. You say, yeah, but Rev, you know, what if they turn away? If they were saved before, they are saved now. 
if. Because check this out. There are some folk that go to church that hadn't been saved. And we think they're saved. They give to the poor. They do missions. They even go on evangelism outings. They attend church. They say hallelujah. They clap when the choir is singing. They actually say amen to the preacher. But they are not saved. But it's not our responsibility to determine who's saved. It's our responsibility to show Christ, to demonstrate who Jesus is. We owe it to God to love our fellow man as we love ourselves. We owe it to God. God bought us with a price. What was that price? What did you say? God bought us with a price. What was that price? His son, his son, Jesus Christ. He gave his blood. He died for us. God paid the price for us. And when you pay for something, you can tell it what to do. Your car is supposed to do what you tell it to do. If you turn the key or you push the button, it's supposed to start because you bought it. God bought us with the price, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God bought us. And he reserves the right to tell us what to do. Isn't that something? Is that crazy? Just because God bought me, he shouldn't be able to. Yeah, he can. He's supposed to tell you what to do. We owe it to God. As God tell us to love our fellow man. We owe it to God to love our fellow man as ourselves. We owe it to God. Always remind the patient of God's unconditional love. Who has John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. So God had a purpose in mind, and he still has a purpose in mind. His purpose was never to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. But his purpose was to send Jesus Christ to redeem the world, to save the world. He commended his love toward us for Jesus to save us. God loved the world so. Remember, so is not, it's not a measurement of how much God loves us. Because if you go back up between verses 1 through 16, you will find out that Mo, as, just as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so God shows his love toward mankind. Why did Moses hold up a serpent in the wilderness? Why did he raise up a serpent? Somebody, why did Moses raise up a serpent in the wilderness? What was the condition? What were what was the atmosphere? Uh, the serpents were biting the people, and the people were dying. Okay. And so I think he raised the serpent up. If you look up at the serpent, then you'll read it. Okay. So we have this serpent, a bronze serpent, a serpent. The people were getting bit by snakes. And when they were getting bit by a snake, they died. They didn't have a Dr. Red Duke in the crowd. The people were getting bit by snakes and they died. God orders Moses, Moses, what you do is take a serpent, raise it up. And those who were not too stubborn, they would look up at the serpent. And when they look up at the serpent, they will live even though they got bit. So then Jesus says, just as Moses held up the serpent in the wilderness and the people lived, so if we lift up Jesus, because God loves us so much, so if we lift up Jesus, people who look to Jesus will live. Wow. The songwriter says, look to Jesus. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. The revival song says, look and live. Look to Jesus and you will live. If you don't look to Jesus, you won't live. Is he talking about the physical death? No, he's talking about the spiritual death. 
The death will flee if you look to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? God had a plan. He still has a plan. His plan was never to condemn the world. His plan was to redeem the world, to save the world. And he chose his only begotten son to do it. His only unique son. His only one of a kind son. Jesus Christ. He did it. So I want to take Romans 3, 23 for me. Romans 3 and 23. Meet the patient on the patient's territory. Meet the patient on the patient's territory. Meet the patient on his or her territory. When the soul winner presents the gospel well, the patient shall feel that the message is just for him or her. When you present the, 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 the gospel well, people sitting in the pew, people surrounding you, they will believe today's message was just for me. Have you ever been to church and sound like the preacher just talking to me? Anybody? I have one story and I said that something. Now, let me tell you this. Sometimes when the preacher's talking to you, you get mad. Because the word is a two-edged sword. The same gospel, the same message that makes Susie shout will make Annie pout. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've left church. I can't testify for you, but I can testify myself. I left church, and when I got outside, I was bleeding, cut up like Zorro hit me. Was I bleeding out? My heart had been convicted. Because the, the, the message called me out and pointed. It's like the preacher was pointing his finger at me. Look, God is just pointing his finger at me. That message was just for me. Too often we want to take the, the message back home and give it to somebody else like God is telling us to take home some leftovers. But God has the message. Even tonight, somebody in this room ought to get a message from tonight. It's just for you. It is just for you. It is just for you. When you present the gospel message well, when you present it really well, people will feel that the message is just for them. Demonstrate your interest in that person's well-being. Demonstrate your interest is in that person's well-being. Let him know his well-being is your main concern. If you win souls for Jesus Christ, the man, the woman, the boy, girl needs to know that you're really concerned about them. I am not talking about the church hugs we do. We just doing stuff. We we doing stuff out of tradition. So David's rushing up here right quick. Let me show you what the church hug looks like. Hurry, 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 hurry. The church church hug. This is what the church hug looks like. See that fake smile right there? See that smile? That, you start off with that kind of smile. <laughs> you start off with that kind of smile. You know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in church, so I ought to do this. So show me how the church hood look. Oh, she ain't got it. And, and you bump, and you move up. Let me show you how the church hood Does that, that show concern? And in some churches, they demonstrate to you how you're supposed to hug in church. You're supposed to. And somebody said, you can keep that. <laughs> Are you with me? But thank you. So, so we have to understand that people need to know we care. People need to know that we're for real. Because people can tell when you're just doing stuff, just because you're in the right place. One lady said, I don't even mess with that church no more. And she said, just like that, I don't even mess with that church no more. Because they take it out of content when Paul says, meet each other with a, with a, a, a holy kiss. They take it out of content. Or meet each other with a hug. They take it out of content because when they greet you in church, it looks real. But when they see you in the grocery store, they barely wave. It's fake. 
Aren't you just as excited to see the same person in the grocery store as you are in church? So it's all about demonstrating the interest of, and that you have interest in their well-being. Let him know that his well-being is your main concern. You can't be on your phone texting when you're talking about somebody about Jesus. You can't be on your phone strolling when you're talking to somebody about Jesus. They need to know that you are real and you are there for them. Personalize your presentation of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to make it personal. You got to be personal with this thing. You got to make sure that this person knows that if it was no one else on planet Earth but them, then that person would be the one that you're concerned about because that's the one that Jesus is concerned about. Create an atmosphere in which the patient feels that he is not alone. You're not, you got to let them know. I know Jesus is with you, but I'm with you too. That's why people love to say they got to ride or die. What does that mean, Ashley? What does ride or die mean? It's my ride or die. What does that mean? They with you through thick and thin. I see. My ride or die. Do I have any ride or dies with me in here? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I got to check the audience. I got I to see what, if somebody coming here the wrong way and you know, all off in the, into themselves, I got to see if I got any ride or dies in here. Somebody, I didn't see any hands. Uh, maybe I look online. Anybody online? <laughs> Do I have any ride or die? Let me see. I don't see anybody online that's a ride or die either. Nobody raised their hand. So we need to understand that the person that we're witnessing to need to know that we're with them and they're not alone. We need to know. Everybody needs to know. Everybody in the group needs to know that, hey, we're together in this thing. Use yourself as an example. Now don't say, look, I'm up here and I got here because the Lord gave me favor. Wrong time for that testimony. Look what I got, and I've been where you are. Now look where I am. That's the wrong time. Because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have messed up. Who has Romans 3.23? We all have sinned. We all have fallen short. We all have messed up. Romans 3.23 says everybody messed up. We all messed up. We all fall. The preacher messed up. The ushers messed up. Deacons messed up. And we all need Jesus. So we must establish common ground with the patient. The soul winner must remember that he was once in sin and God delivered him. The soul winner has to know that he or she was once in sin and God re delivered him, redeemed him. Moved him out of his stuff. He cannot afford to be pious. The perfection of your walk is not the issue. The perfection of your walk is not the issue. Don't make your perfection the main issue. Don't give all the examples built around you. The perfection of Jesus Christ is the issue. It's his perfection. The reason why we repent, the reason why we confess our sin is because we realize that we've fallen short. We realize that God is perfect and we are imperfect. And we're coming to God saying, God, look, we are wrong and you are right. And Lord, I repent. I messed up. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. The perfection of Jesus Christ is the issue. Jesus Christ's perfection is what we need to put on front street. Check the patient's heartbeat. Make sure the patient clearly understands his condition and knows what it will take, what course of action it will take to heal his condition, his heartfelt conviction. We got to check, check your patient. That's why you can't get them saved and leave them. 
It's like a woman having a baby and say, grow up. And that's it. Having a baby and say, go eat. Having a baby and say, survive. When, when a baby is born, even in his spiritual walk, we have to nourish it. We have to build it up. We have to carry it for a while. We have to tell them when to cry, when not to cry. We have to tell them when to eat, when to stop eating. We have to tell them when to wake up and when to go to bed. Because if you don't tell a baby when to wake up and when to go to bed, you'll be trying to sleep at night and they'll be sleeping in the night, in the daytime. And they'll be wide awake at night trying to figure out why you sleep. What, what you doing? What's wrong with you? Why are you sleeping at night? I'm up. Wake up. And guess what? They're going to proceed to wake you up. So when someone is saved, you got to walk with them. You got to spend time with them. You got to be a part of their lives. You got to walk with them. You got to be a part and make them know your heartfelt conviction is that God wants you saved. And now that you're saved, I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to walk with you. Every person ought to have some people in their lives. The number one person, you need a model, a role model in your life, someone you will look up to. The next person you need is a friend, someone you look across to. Y'all share things together, good, bad, and ugly. It's called accountability. Everybody needs accountability. And then you need somebody who, who can look up to you. Everybody, every David needed Jonathan, a buddy friend. Every Elijah needs an Elisha, somebody that you can mentor. And then every Elisha needs an Elijah, someone that can train you and teach you. The problem is sometimes people can't say anything to you, then that's a problem. Demonstrate love for the patient. Demonstrate love for the patient. What does the word demonstrate mean? What is demonstrate? What is demonstrate? Show. Show. Anything else? Demonstrate. Demonstrate. In, in high school, I had a coach, and that's been more than 43 years ago. In the 10th grade, I had a coach, a baseball coach. I didn't play baseball under him, but he was a baseball coach, but he was also the English teacher on campus. And the reason why I love going to Jack Thompson's class is because he did not teach English. He coached English. He demonstrated it. And he made it where there was always a contest in the room. And someone would go to the board and write a sentence down. That's when we had what was known as black boards, which was green boards. They had black boards. Anybody know what a black board looked like in the 21st century? They had black boards and white chalk. When you, when you left his English class, you had chalk everywhere. And what he would do is he would have you write a sentence the proper way on the board. And then he will have the, the children in the room, the, your classmate, determine whether it was written with, with proper structure, proper language, proper subject verb agreement. And then he will coach you through it. And when you wrote it, you would have to justify why you put that verb with that, that word. Or you put that antecedent where you put it. So he coached it. He made it come alive. He demonstrated to us how English ought to be. And here I am 43 years later thanking God for Jack Thompson and still breaking bird. But I wouldn't know what I know then, what I know now, nor then if it had not been for him coaching it. Because when I went to English class before Jack Thompson, they were just boring classes. But he coached it. So the word demonstrate. Confirm God's love by your display of loving support. You got to be supportive. Exercise godly character. Be a living testimony. Avoid getting agitated or angry with the patient. Have you ever talked to somebody and they just made you so, I mean, you like, Lord, when is this conversation going to be over? He says, a person's life is at stake. A person's life is on the line. 
a person new birth is available. And you need to make sure that you don't get so agitated, so frustrated, so angry with the patient until you drop the patient off. It's like dropping a baby off. Demonstrate tenderheartedness and loving kindness. Remember the patient is afraid and needs a lot of assurance and compassion. The patient needs a lot of assurance. The patient needs a lot of compassion. Confirm God's concern for the patient. So here you are. You're concerned about the unsaved. God is concerned about the unsaved. There are so many people who have never been told that God loves them. There are many people who have not been told by anybody, I love you. Sometimes when boys are acting out, girls are acting out, it's because nobody told them they love them. Nobody's giving them a hug. Nobody has walked with them hand in hand through their troubles. Confirms God's concern for the patient. That's after you've shown your concern and you keep. Because when you show your concern, then they will listen to you and they will know that God is concerned. Exemplify your love for God. Jesus Christ possesses a great passion for souls. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record brief accounts of Jesus' tireless grace, tender mercy, and loving compassion for people. Pastor Charles Stanley says it like this. We must possess a passion for God and a compassion for mankind if we are going to reach the world for Christ. We must possess a passion for God, a love for God, enthusiasm for God, and a compassion for mankind. That's the only way we're going to reach the world for Christ. Jesus' heart went out to the lost and the guilty sinners. Is your heart going out to the lost and the guilty? Is God making you so passionate about him and so compassionate about mankind that your heart goes out to them? He, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 and 10, Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. He didn't come for the privileged. He came to seek and save the lost. Such is the case with soul winner. He or she must pray for passion, passion for God and compassion for mankind and walk in the spirit of the almighty God. We must walk in the spirit of the almighty God. We have to walk in the spirit of the almighty God. We got to have compassion for people. We have to have a love and a passion for godliness. We got to let people know, not only does God love you, I love you. If no one has ever told you that I love you, I'm telling you, I love you. What's wrong with me telling a man I love him? What's wrong with me telling a boy I love him? Because there's a different form of love. Phileo, phileo, philia. Where we get the word brotherly love, Philadelphia. Brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. We ought to have love one to the other. Back home they said, we love you so. We love you, well, we love runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. That's your love, God. You need to love people. And if we go into heaven, we're going to get rid of this place. We got to exemplify love. Because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus demonstrated his love for mankind. Jesus gave his life. God gave his son. He died on Calvary. Buried him in a borrowed tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead because of passion for God 
and compassion for mankind. We gotta be passionate about what we do. We gotta be passionate about winning souls. We gotta love this thing called soul winning. Every church has its flagship. Every church has something they're known for. This is the question. What is, what is your church known? How is your church known? For what is your church known? Is it just like the preacher said, this little church sitting on the side of the road, we don't identify with anything or anybody. What does the New Beginning Church identify with? What are we all about? Are we loving people to Christ? Are we compassionate with people? Are we excited about winning souls? Or we just show up on Sunday and, and check the box? Show up on Wednesday and check the box. Pastor ain't gonna look at me Sunday like crazy because I went to, I went Wednesday. Just check the box. What we need to understand is we gotta have passion for God. We have to have compassion for mankind. We're not up here and they're down here. We walking together. Amen? The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Someone who's heard us tonight would like to give their lives to Christ. This is your moment. You can receive Jesus Christ as your own Savior right here, right now. Just invite him into your life. If you want to invite him into your life, please bow your head with me and invite him in. Just repeat this simple prayer and ask Jesus into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you prayed this prayer, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven. I want you to get passionate about loving God and compassionate with all men. We thank God for this another privilege to share and to be a part of his service and to watch what God is doing in our church and outside our church. Certainly, we need prayer in our city. We need prayer in our state. We need prayer in our nation. We need prayer in our world. So we want to spend time, not in our spare time, but spend time calling on God. I said last week, prayer is free. Prayer doesn't cost. There's no cover charge to prayer. We just want to lift men, women, boys, and girls before the Lord and ask God to bless it. We ask God to continue to walk with us. We ask God to continue to make a difference in our lives. So next Wednesday night, I um, want you to prepare. During the week, prepare by looking at, at prescribe, chapter five, prescribe, look at chapter five, prescribe, and be prepared for your exam when we see each other again, and be prepared to share how you led somebody to Christ and how Jesus opened the door and you walked in the door. So look at chapter five and be prepared to witness to somebody as you pass them in your day-to-day -day going. So next week, next Wednesday, we will be virtual. We will have virtual Bible study next week. What is virtual? Okay, see you here next week. Come on by next week. No one knows what virtual is, so come on to church next week and we'll have Bible study. We'll have Bible study next week and, and um, watch what God is doing. I mean, boy, when I said virtual, folk wanted to get up and shout and run. I mean, I thought you wanted Bible study. 
So let's look at chapter five next week, and um, we will we will do virtual Bible study next week. And um, watch what God does. We're gonna look to to close this book out in the next two sessions or so. Then we will we will demonstrate winning souls for Christ. So be prepared to share and to demonstrate how you can win souls for Christ as we finish this book up in the next two weeks. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. God wants us to win souls for Christ. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is a good opportunity. Yeah, people should clap right there. We should clap and, and praise God for the opportunity of giving. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. And our, our PO Box is PO Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. That's PO Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. 774 Father God, we thank you now for your gifts. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Father God, for the offering. We ask you to bless us as we give tonight. Bless us to give not grudgingly, nor out of necessity. For we know, Lord, you love cheerful givers. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for walking us through your word. We ask you to continue to speak clearly through your word, Father God, that your word will be real to us. And Lord, we ask you to bless our church, to be a church with passion and compassion. Passion to live for Christ, passion to win souls for Christ, passion to praise you. And Lord, give us compassion. The compassion for mankind that is that seem to be worse off than we are. Bless us, Father God, that we will be compassionate and patient with them. Bless us that we are long-suffering, Father God. And bless us, Father God, to call men to knowledge in Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen and amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. God bless you.